Hey, welcome to the SBP Podcast, Mobile Filmmaking Episode 78. I'm your host, Susie Botello. It's not every day that you can ask someone working in the Hollywood film industry to share their thoughts on making movies with smartphone cameras. You are going to find lots of good advice from a Hollywood producer in this episode. Bradley Gallo has been in the film industry for many years, and it just so happens that when we recorded this episode, Universal Pictures, yeah, that one, Universal Pictures had just announced a partnership with Amasia Entertainment, which is co-founded by Bradley Gallo. Speaking about smartphone movies, this weekend, April 25th and 26th, is the Virtual International Mobile Film Festival, which is due to the coronavirus, COVID-19, taking place online. This weekend is the ninth edition, which takes place every last weekend in April, each year right here in San Diego. This year, we screened 28 short and feature films, all shot with smartphones from all over the world. So just grab some snacks and take a break from all those quarantine activities And just enjoy some films and be inspired. Go to our website, internationalmobilefilmfestival.com to get all the details and stay tuned. But now, let's talk with Bradley. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the SBP podcast. I have a special guest with me, Bradley Gallo from, uh, well, let me see. You are in L.A., right, Bradley? Yeah, I work at Amazia Entertainment, and we're here based in Los Angeles and Beverly Hills. That's pretty awesome. Uh, Bradley is here to chat with you uh, to basically inform and inspire you uh, to make your movies uh, using your smartphones, and he's going to share a lot of really great information from the perspective of someone in Beverly Hills and someone in the industry. Um, and speaking of the industry, Bradley, you've got some great news that uh, I think you should share with our listeners, so just go for it. Yeah, well, we just uh, signed and closed our deal with uh, Universal Pictures on our property, The Green Hornet. We've been working a long time on uh, trying to get the rights. We acquired the rights to Green Hornet, and then we had a, uh, had a, uh, were looking for a studio to work with, and we found the studio that we felt uh, most worked well with us, and we got it, and it's Universal Pictures, and we announced it today, and it's in all the trades. And so Michael and I, my partner in Amazia Entertainment, are really excited, ready, ready to go, and get our writer and director for the project. That is amazing. Bradley, uh, before I, I speak a little bit more about your, your history really quick, how do you, how do you go about, um, doing what you did? Because that's quite an achievement. I mean, the green Hornet that goes back to the 1930s, right? Yeah, the forties. And it was a radio series. Uh, and, um, well, well, my, my partner in the business has been tracking that project, uh, for most of his career and tried to get it at different companies that he worked at. And uh, we negotiated three years ago um, to try and get it. And we lost out to Paramount and Peter Chernin. And, and then we, we, we tried again when it came up again. And, and, we, and we were lucky enough and honored enough for the family to, uh, to trust us with it. But, I mean, I've been working uh, in all forms of the independent film business and media and journalism uh, since I started out of college and, uh, and it's been, a, it's been a wild ride and there's no one way to make it happen. But, uh, you know, if you just keep working hard diligently and uh, I've been doing so, so, um, I, I've been getting a couple of lucky breaks along the way and the rest has been hard work. Well, obviously, and in order to stay, stay in this industry, you basically, you're not allowed to make anyone mad at you. You, you, it's, it's really important to have a really good, um, uh, to have integrity and have a good reputation because the word gets around, uh, when you're working on, on films of the caliber of films that you're working on, 
I was looking at some of the films. Would you mind rattling off some of the, the films that you've uh, lately have been working working on? Yeah, well, when I lived in New York most of my life. And when I moved to L.A. Uh, and I joined a company called Troika Pictures, we made three movies. One is The Call with Halle Berry and Abigail Breslin, uh, directed by Brad Anderson. And then we made a movie called uh, Care for What You Wish For with Nick Jonas. Um, we did a movie called The Road Within, starring Zoe Kravitz and Deb Patel, and uh, that was an excellent uh, small movie made here in L.A. A movie called Mr. Right with Sam Rockwell and Anna Kendrick, uh, which we uh, did as our first movie at Amage Entertainment. Uh, and then recently we had a Sundance uh, film in 2019 uh, called Them That Follow, which uh, started a, a bunch of people, Walton Goggins, Olivia Coleman who won the Oscar recently, Jim Gaffigan, the comedian, Caitlin Deaver, who was in Booksmart, Lewis Pullman, who's Bill Pullman's son, an amazing talent, love him to death, Thomas Mann. So, I mean, we, we've been working with some really great people. And then uh, and then right now in post, we're in post on a, com- on a movie called Wild Mountain Time, starring Emily Blunt, John Hamm, Christopher Walken, and Jamie Dornan. And we're really excited about that. It was written and directed by John Patrick Shanley, the famous playwright. Christopher Walken, you just said a name in there that someone that I I'd I'd love to meet someday. Not that I'll get to, but um, but still, that's a pretty impressive list you just shared with everyone. Um, so Bradley, uh, about the company that that you're working in, Amasia, right? Entertainment. Mm-hmm. Uh, when that's did you right. When did you start that? Nine years ago, with my partner Michael Halfan, we left Troika to start this company. Uh, and, uh, it's been a, it's been a wonderful ride. Uh, we just do everything, uh, bootstrapped and we, you know, raise money from private investors and, and we have a team, we have a head of television, we have production execs and development execs. We're a small team of six, but it, it works really well. And, uh, and you know, it, we started it nine years ago. I love that you just said that a small team of six, because I think the, um, you know, some of our listeners who are not familiar with this industry um, may think that in order to get to where you are today, you need a company or a studio, right? That has, you know, hundreds of people working in it. Yeah, no, you can do it on your own. I know plenty of people on their own production companies and they're just one person with maybe an assistant. Uh, and you know, if you start getting a lot of traction, you're going to need some help. And that's why we built up to the six, but it's been six for a very long time. And when we were at Troika, it was only three or four. So, uh, I like to keep things, uh, inexpensive and that's why we're good at making small, you know, low budget films, uh, when we need to. And the bigger budget films are done with the studio and are done with all of that help. Bradley, what is your favorite, uh, the, the most favorite thing you've done, the most memorable part you've played, because you're also an actor, you're, you've directed, you've written, uh, you've, uh, you've been a, a producer, an associate producer, executive producer. What is your favorite thing to do? Which, which is your favorite play? I mean, well, I've, I've come into my own as a producer, and the reason why I ended up liking that the most was because you get to be a little bit a part of everything. And then the better writers, the better directors, and the better actors can do their job. And I get to cheerlead them, put them in the best place to be the most creative, uh, foster their artistic uh, sense of uh, creativity in, in the projects that we're doing. And so I feel like a one big, large head counselor, you know, in, in, in keeping everybody to have a family, great time when we're on set, make the best work possible. And, and, and give the bridge between art and commerce because this business involves both a, a lot of money and a lot of creativity and we have to get them to converge together. And I find at the center of that is, is where I like to be. And that probably brought, I mean, you probably came through that through networking, right? Um, I think just pure gut, grit, networking, uh, also some some connections that I thought were... Uh, helpful. I mean, I made my first film when I was 21 years old, and I raised that money from family, uh, friends, doctors, uh, lawyers, you know, rich, any, anybody who had extra money to, that believed in my vision. And that, le- that led me off into the film festival world and writing more scripts and, and just sort of working along the way. And, you know, eventually you build a network. It took, you know, 20 plus years to build a network. But, 
but there are people who, who come into this business and in two years they build an entire network. It's, it's just what are you good at? And, and I have my strengths and my weaknesses and so do most of you guys. Well, and the other thing about networking, networking, the word itself just sounds like such a big task. You know, it almost yeah. it almost sounds like it's not fun, like, oh, I have to network, you know, but it's something it's very natural. It's a very flow of um, I mean, it, it almost shouldn't feel that way at all. You, you have to be conscious of your relationships, which is really what networking is, is about building relationships and um, connecting them to your projects. And uh, well, for some of our listeners, connecting people to your dreams and your goals, right? Yeah, you're building friendships for sure, and you're doing it – if you can put yourself in the position to be around them, whether you're in the California side of things or the New York side of things or the Georgia or Louisiana, if you're in the areas where everybody is working in film and TV, then when you're going to that coffee shop, you're going to meet somebody in film and TV. And when you're and when you're friends with friends with friends of friends, they're all sort of working in the business, and so you're building these relationships, and then you go to them when you think they can – uh, be of help to you and they come to you and you can be of help to them and you start to build your network slowly over time. I was at a disadvantage. I moved to LA at the age of 33. So it, it took me nine years to get to where I'm at and I may have accelerated because of my, uh, the way I am as a, as a producer, but uh, it still took nine more years extra from from the 33 that I was on this planet. So I, I would say networking is the most important part and you get started right away and you do the best you can in collecting, uh, you know, connections. Well, what do you, how do you, um, how do you feel? When did you first hear about people making uh, movies with their smartphone cameras? Um, well, I mean, I know it's been going on for a while, but the movie that sort of blew me up uh, was tan when I saw Tangerine, I was impressed by the content. I was impressed by I never really realized it was on a cell phone, <laughs> and uh, I, I, that blew me away. Even though I know Soderbergh had done some some stuff, and other people were trying to pull it together earlier, uh, but you know what, that was when you saw the power of the mobile phone and filmmaking. Yeah, and and there's a unique. Um thing about mobile filmmaking about using your phone where um i mean as you can imagine i have with the international mobile film festival i get to watch a lot of films and um some people go about it just as um as any other filmmaker would go about making a film right just trying mm -hmm. to use the phone as a regular camera but it's not a regular camera and I think that's one of the things that Sean Baker from Tangerine and um, Steven Soderbergh have have done, which has made them more successful, has been to uh, really see the virtues of the mobile phone um, and use that to the advantage of the storytelling. Yes, I thought they uh, I, they they certainly took the limitations and the benefits of having the mobile phone and use them to their advantage to make really great films. And the fact that those scripts and the stories were also uh, really good didn't hurt, and it became kind of a big thing in the industry where we all paid attention to that. It may have been what spurned Quibi. Uh, you know, there are just the fact that that's a distribution network for small content for mobile phones. So I just thought it was very impressive. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um what would you say is one of the most important things that a, a, a mobile filmmaker could do or any filmmaker um, could do in order to, to make them get the best out of their networking or get seeing in the industry? Well, what I always say about the, mo the mobile phone film, mobile making in general, it's the most inexpensive way to do stuff. So if me as a producer, I'm, whether it was made on your mobile phone or any, any other way that you can do it, if I'm able to get to see a short film that you've made or to see a film that you have made, uh, you know, and you put it on YouTube or you sent it to me in an email and it shows your talent, it's going to perk me up and get you to meet with my team and, and want to understand you, what you could do uh, with that phone and, and or what you can do in, in the big time world too, because you know, uh, it just shows the creativity and the, and the ingenuity that you 
that you have the ability to do. And we make a lot of our decisions based on seeing uh, short films uh, or films that come to us in that way that are kind of showing us a concept or, or proving out a concept of their script. You know, I mean, look what happened with that epic snowball fight uh, that the director, John Wick, did. I mean, talk about looking like I had no, unless they told me that I would have never known that was on a, an iPhone 11 Pro, you know? Oh, and it's it's only going to get better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. How, um, how, I mean, obviously a producer, um, as an executive producer, actually, you probably get a lot of uh, emails and messages and people just sort of knocking on your door. Um, how do you how do you filter that to 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 know who you're going to actually pay some attention to because it's time consuming you'd be surprised uh i mean look i have a team and and so there's a development exec and then there's a junior development assistant and they they read the stuff um and then they they give they give me like coverage on that and if i like it i say i want to read it or they say i love this you need to read it i do i do read a lot of stuff um, but I also, I also allow people to reach out to me during, with social media and I have answered many LinkedIn's and many, uh, Twitter's and, and all kinds of stuff on Facebook where if I think there's something interesting that they send me, I'll forward it to the team and say, if you guys find this interesting, uh, contact them directly and, and request a script. Or if I find it really interesting, I immediately give them the email to one of my team members and say, send the script to, to him or her and, and let me know what you think. Like, I've done that. So it, it, the same thing goes for if somebody sent me a really impressive short or trailer to one of their films and I think there's something there, I'll, I'll, I'll let them know. I mean, I'm pretty easy to find and open to getting stuff. And, you know, if it's really good, we're going to recognize it. What would you say, you know, like, for example, let's just say I'm going to make a movie with my phone. And I've got a right. I've got a screenplay. And of course, I think it's the biggest movie in the world, the best thing out there. You know, it's my cake. So I think it's the best one. Um, so let's say that I'm going to do that. Now, what would it what would be the one thing that that I should pay attention to the most in making my film? Making so, your mobile making film my, that you're going to go do right now? Yeah, in order to say I want Bradley to take a look at this and, and have and impress him. Right. Well, a lot of the times that is going to be determined by is there something that rises above the noise? And what I mean by that, is there a subject matter that we're tapping into or a comical moment or dramatic moment that's tapped into that I can be like, wow, I didn't think of that. I, I, I laughed really hard at that. I, I, I'm amazed by that issue. And I really want to, or you did something so spectacular with the phone that we haven't seen before. And that's the opening, uh, to me, or you've attached, you know, a very impressive deck, you know, two or three, four page deck that shows me the concept. And then they, you know, you attach a short clip of how you're going to do that concept or it's IP. You, you somehow you got the rights to a comic or something and you created that uh, a, sort of a trailer on your cell phone of how you would go about it or storyboards. Just something that just sort of wakes me up out of my normal constant drone of things coming to me, you know. Do you ever get a lot, pardon the way I'm going to ask this, but do you get a lot of um, repeat offenders? Uh, no, I think because I'm very respectful in my writing back, it, it happens from time to time, but a lot of times I'll just be like, look, you know, this isn't something for our company, but I, I appreciate the passion or, um, you know, we're not looking for period pieces right now. You know, they're very happy to get a reply. And, and I feel that I, I've struggled and tried to make it when I was starting out as well. And, and, and any reply meant a lot to me. So I've treated those submissions with respect. I mean, the one thing you don't do is send, you know, a text or an email or, a, you know, a, a Facebook messenger that's like three, four pages long. And you're just like, I'm not reading all this. This is ridiculous, you know? Uh, so those I don't respond to because you should know better. 
<laughs> you said it, not me this time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those are those are a real turn off. It's like I don't even know you. Where are you coming with right. with the Bible? Yeah, basically? and it's so obvious that you're sending that mass to everybody else and hoping that something sticks. It's never going to stick to nobody. No, it's true. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things that um, I mean, we talked about the proof of concept, um, but shorts. I want to. I you know, I'm I'm. I think there are more and more feature films that that are being made now with the smartphone. But we can't lose sight of the benefits of short films, especially when they're shot with phones. I don't know how many short films you've watched that are shot with mobile phones, um, but they are so impressive. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to invite you right now, just so that I don't miss the opportunity to do that. Our film festival that's happening this month is going to be virtually uh well, it's going to be a virtual film festival. Right. And so I'm going to, I am going to send you a link for that and we'll have it on the notes as well. But um, I want you to hopefully watch some of these shorts because I think they're so impressive. You know, uh, some yeah, of Yeah, I some love of... shorts. I watch more shorts in my year than I do watch movies because they're always attached to scripts or projects or packages. And it's so much easier for me to sit there and watch 15 minutes than watch somebody's whole movie. So shorts are uh, I'm a big fan of. And I'm happy to watch your top three or four or whatever happens. Uh, I, I'm glad we re- watched them. Yeah, some of the some of the content, it's like um, one of the things I learned when I was in, in college. Um, I actually thought I wanted one of my, my first dreams was to be a writer for commercials. And my, my reasoning for that was that uh, first of all, you had to pack a big punch in a in a short story format, right? Right. And the but the the cool thing that I found out while I was researching that was that basically the cost of a production for a sixty second commercial could be even greater than an entire feature film. That's absolutely correct. So you're right on to it. Yeah, and so one should never dismiss the power of a short story or a short film. I agree 100%. It can be more powerful than a film sometimes. Um, When we're talking about low-budget films, a lot of people feel like that means the production value is low-budget as far as value is concerned. What do you consider value? Um, Because I, I... I feel differently about that. Well, I don't think of the word low budget as a bad thing. I think of it as uh, just to give the industry the understanding that we made this movie on uh, on peanuts, and that's why it looks so amazing. Uh, that I'm, I'm a talented filmmaker, and I put together this movie for only you know two hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, whatever it is. And um, we use that we use the word micro budget now, mm-hmm. and micro budget filmmaking is very very popular. And very paid and is paid attention to by all of us, um, because if you can make a movie for a micro budget and it can do really well, uh, then then the economics of that is better for for the distribution companies. So um, I am totally for high quality micro budgets. I watch them and I make them. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what was out of all the films that are out? Uh that you've ever watched in your life, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, what would be one of the most, and I know this is hard. I'm asking you something that I always don't want to answer myself. So (laughs) sorry. Uh, But what would be the most memorable film that you would say that really inspired you to even get into this industry? Well, it's a product of timing in my life, right? So I'm, I'm very much a like stand by me, goodwill hunting type of guy, dead poet society. Those are the movies that moved me and uh, I'm a product of the eighties. So there are a bunch of eighties movies and this is a really strange one, but ordinary people had a big effect on me because my family's a bunch of therapists and that was like filmmaking with therapy. And, uh, and so, but the movie that like wowed me and made me think, and this is way later in my, my life, but, 
that wowed me and made me think, well, you know what, I, I, I'll never be able to do that, but I want to be able to do that. And so if I can work really hard towards that goal, um, maybe I'll get halfway there. And that was at the time, 1997, when Titanic came out. Oh. From a producer standpoint, which $200 million for a movie was huge, was insane. Uh, and, and what the production value, what it would take to make a production where you got a storyline, a love story, the production of, of this story was just so, so ridiculously talented. I, I was blown away. I saw that movie four times in the theaters. And, you, you know, a lot of people make fun of me because, you know, I was back then. It was like you're a guy and you're watching Titanic and you think that's the best movie. Well, that was amazing. I don't care what anyone says. And I watched it four times in the theaters. And then when they re-released it recently, I went there and watched it again. <laughs> you know, I am a big fan of a movie like that. Of course I love Goodfellas. Of course I love Godfather. Of course I love all that. I'm Italian, right? Yeah. And, I, and there's tons of stuff, epic stuff that I love, you know, the Gone with the Winds and the, and the uh, you know, I can't, you know, whatever, Raiders of the Lost Arks. And I love all of that stuff. But Titanic had a massive impression on making me feel that that was with the industry and that was the position that I was really impressed with and wanted to do. That's actually, that's funny. Uh, another little connection. Um, I have one of my best friends actually worked on the on the set of that film. And she she had uh, three children. The youngest one, I think, was like two or three years old. And she said she practically raised her children on the set. Wow. Yeah. Well, let's, let's not forget that the, the, the actors, remember, they have their SAG actors and the extras that may, may or the bit parts that only have like a line. Yeah. Um, those those actors, the ones who had like a line, got paid a million dollars in the end because when the movie comes out and the residual checks come in, it's a the guy the guy the one of those guys we knew uh, thought it was a ten thousand dollar check and kind of missed the fact that it was a million dollar check. Wow. Yeah. You you get confused when you first see you know it's on a big a check. number. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's so many zeros. You're going. I don't even know what this is. Right. Um, wow. And then, of course, there are the stories of the films that, you know, the royalty payments, which are like one penny and it comes in a paper check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so funny. Talk yeah. about a, a roller coaster ride in this industry. But you have to love it, right? I mean, is that not really all that it comes down to, whether you're going to you, you're doing it for to make a bunch of money or not? What the dream is really about is about getting to do something you love to do, right? Yeah, I'm not in. It's amazing. That's that's evolved over time. When I first started, I had this, you know, normal, huge energy and massive ego. And I'm going to write and direct and produce and become the next big Woody Allen or whatever that was at the time. <laughs> Edward Burns. And over time, I, I started to realize how much I love what I do, how much I love the business and and how much money isn't really a motivator for me. I mean, it's nice to have it. It would be great if we get real success and pull that off. But it will only lead me to being able to make more films and be more involved in the industry, it, it doesn't be, it isn't the reason I'm pushing and you should never do that. And this industry, a lot of people are, who are big time producers, you know, I live in a one bedroom apartment. I don't have some huge, you know, Mercedes sitting outside. It's, it, it, it's not about that anymore. You're, you, if you're doing this, you better be doing it because you love it and, and not be focused on the, the fame and the fortune. Yeah. I mean, it's about basically, right. It's about being able to continue to do it and not have to take the time to go work at Starbucks or something instead. So that you yes, can, continue. that's what it is. If you can get paid 50, if you can get paid your, your expenses, you make $50,000 a year and, and you're just, and you're, you're making films, you should be very, very happy. That's right. Um, what, what would you say? I mean, you watched Obviously, you fell in love with with Tangerine, um, with this film. But what would you what would you say about uh, your perspective on the future of filmmaking with mobile phones? Well, it's really the future of um, inexpensive, you know, cost va uh, value for studios and filmmakers and independent producers. So. If, if mobile filmmaking can get to the level where lighting and everything can be done uh, and it's cost less, then that's going to that's going to drive the industry. But it's all about that. If the cameras, if the, if the big cameras meet the, the small cameras in the level of quality, then we're always going to go with the small and inexpensive 
that looks just as good, you know. So I think there's a good future in mobile filmmaking. Uh, it's probably it's probably something we should be focused on more. Well, you brought up a film. Uh, was it Ordinary People? Yes. So uh, was Kiefer Sutherland in that film? Yes. No, okay. just Donald Sutherland. Donald, Donald Sutherland. Okay. Well, um, I think some of the films that you just that you just mentioned uh, could have been shot with uh, with iPhones yeah. or whatever, huh? Yes, yeah, for sure. They could have shot ordinary people for sure. That's not some big special effects crazy film at all. There's yeah. none. It's just people talking. Global hunting could have done that way. By me, it could have been done that way. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Titanic, Titanic wouldn't ugh. have been able to do that at this point, but maybe someday. Well, you know, I don't know if you're aware. I mean, some of the CGI effects and things like that could still be done, uh, just not at that level, though. You know, right, right, but right, right. but you could still film something with a smartphone. Actually, even years ago, uh, I'll, I'm going to send you a link to a film um, called The Other Side, made by Conrad Mess. Okay. Uh, he was one of the first, uh, well, actually, he was the first filmmaker to submit a film to our film festival. Oh, cool. um, yeah. And when I received that film, because, you know, I was like literally begging people, Bradley, like right. going, going out, you know, make a film, make a film, all my friends. And they were like, yeah, right, Susie. <laughs> right. Like, I got I just got my this camera, you know, um, and he made a film. It was called uh, The Fixer. And, and it was a, a short film, seven and a half minute film. Right. And it was done through that a lot of uh, he took put it into Adobe After Effects. Right. Uh, the sound was recorded exter um, external. He actually paid somebody on um, on a website to to read the script, uh, things like that. He lives in uh, in Spain, but there was a film wow. that he made after that. It's called The Other Side. And it was all CGI. There was only a minimal, like a doorway and a table and a bed, you know, just a few little things that were, um, that were, uh, that were real. Everything else was CGI and it's, it's going to impress you, I think. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'll see. I'll see. I have, the, I made Mr. Right with a Spanish filmmaker by the name of Paco Cabezas. I don't know if you know mm. him. And, uh, and we had a great time. We made a great movie together. Wow, that's awesome. What is uh what is your your if let's say that you could or that you had the time to make a mobile film, what genre would you make? I would do horror. Yeah. I'd want to see a really incredible horror film uh with a mobile fund. And I'm sure they've been made, but I haven't seen it yet in the big scale and you know, in terms of distribution. Now and go uh, you could do that. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I said I think there's a lot you can do with a with a with a horror film, and that could be really interesting with a mobile phone, especially since it's you know feels sometimes like the viewpoint of of the viewer is using a phone. So I'm curious to see how that evolves in the horror genre. Um, do you like zombie movies? Sure. What is your favorite um, horror film? Like werewolves. Uh, zombies or just plain you know suspense crimes or well i mean i, I was a huge as again product of the 80s i was a huge friday the 13th guy um forever and I, I i definitely genuinely loved movies like 28 days later or 30 days go into night or whatever that one was called with uh, uh i forgot his name already wow yeah. what, uh, the actor but um i really enjoy those suspenseful what's happening where's the world going you know apocalyptic kind of films but you know if i had to choose it would be the friday the 13th franchise <laughs> <laughs> well maybe there's a there's a way you can kind of put them both together right <laughs> yeah you could that that's another concept that i i like to do a lot is like what if you know, zombies meets uh, Jason Voorhees. I get it. Right. And then Jason Byrne, Bourne, uh, jumps in and, um, you know, right. Saves the day. <laughs> Cause three, three's a company, right? <laughs> you got it. Um, one of the, one of the really cool things I know that, 
I don't want to take up a lot of your time here, but one of the things that we do on this show sometimes, especially with fun people like yourself, is have a little bit of a game. Would you like to play a little game? I'm happy to. Okay. So in this game, uh, what I would like you to to do is because I have not, I have no idea. So how about you share your favorite songs or your favorite, how about this, your favorite musicians? And you do that within about 10 seconds. Uh, that's so easy. Led Zeppelin, Van Morrison. Wait, wait, Zeppelin. wait, wait, wait. I'm going to time you. I'm going to, I know, right? It was so easy. You're like, I'm doing it right now. So actually, let's make that 20 seconds. Otherwise, you'll get you won't get too far. So are you ready? Get set and go. Led Zeppelin, Van Morrison, Zach Brown Band. That's top three. Name. Keep keep going. Oh, keep going. Yeah. Um, You two, Pink Floyd. Uh, I'm a classic rock guy. You know, uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash. Um. I even like Michael Jackson. I can go as far as, uh, let's see, uh, Hootie and the Blowfish and Linus Morissette. That's my era. Nice. Uh, yeah. I and like don't it forget, nice. yeah, I, I'm all over the gamut, you know, even Beyonce, Justin Timberlake, like the modern day stuff is great too. <laughs> I always tell, uh, tell people, you won't believe what I'm listening to and what I just listened to before that. And I think my neighbors are probably going to call the nut house in a minute. <laughs> and my, I like Miles Davis, Lenny Kravitz, that kind of stuff too. too. That's awesome. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to sign off here, but I just want you to okay. share with our our listeners before you go the most epic advice you could come up with to inspire someone who's out there dreaming. And they don't they don't have that much experience, but they have a Google search and a smartphone. They have a Google search and a smartphone, and you want me to give them advice on what to do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, well, I could say the most important advice in that scenario is relevancy. So you need something that is relevant to today, that's, that is happening constantly, that is in the news, that is important, that's a great story that you can tackle first, that's maybe even a true story would be awesome. Mm-hmm. And you take that. And uh, that you'll use your search to get all the research and, and then you can use the search to go and build your crew and uh, and use your search to find uh, financiers and uh, and eventually uh, con- connect to me and and pitch it to me on your search. And then from there, uh, let's see if we can go make a film. That's awesome. Hey, d- did I miss anything? Is there anything else that uh, you'd like to to address before we go? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, no, no, just uh, I'm sure you'll have it on there, but reach out to me on on all social media. Every single one of them is just at Bradley Gallo. And uh, just so our listeners know, um, this really is a nice guy down to earth and someone who is not not kidding around when he's saying reach out to him. Um, But obviously you know, put some thought into what you're going to reach out to him as, and don't send him an automated, uh, 300 or 5,000 word, uh, message. You got it. Thank <laughs> you so much, everybody.